Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Iconus. Uh, this month we're talking about collaborative design and the use of virtual and augmented reality. To do that we have a guest, Roy Damgrave from the University of Twente and we'll see you in a bit. What's up everyone? Thank you very much for listening. Um, we're here to show you the far corners of industrial design engineering again. The, the pioneers, the inventors, the, the people that walk at the front of the branch. Basically what's new in industrial design engineering. Um, we'll try to do one every first Friday of the month. So be there. Uh, my name is Joris. Um, I'm a fifth year industrial design engineering student. And I'm here as usual with Host number two, my boy. Yes, that's right. I'm Jean. Oh, welcome. Before we start, we'd like to thank everyone for listening mm. to our pilot and giving feedback about that. To all the listeners right now, uh, thank you. If you have any feedback, things you like or dislike about the podcast, just let us know. We have like an email podcast at dialus at twente.nl uh, where you can give us, send us feedback and otherwise you can give us feedback in person. You can also, by the way, we'll put it on YouTube yeah. or Spotify. I don't know if you can comment on Spotify, but on YouTube, leave you a comment can, yeah. or a like. Oh, we can like. say that now. <laughs> <laughs> leave a comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but we're honored that you are our guest, uh, Roy Dalfrappe. Um <laughs> How are you doing? Roy yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, just enjoying your introduction here, so uh, I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Sean, you want to tell them about the, the structure? Uh, um, that's new for industrial design engineering, having structure, so... Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> they very much like that. <laughs> okay, um, first we're gonna, we did the introduction. Then we're going to give uh, like the punch budget of the month. That's a moment where we are going to throw our new um, things that we came up with or like um, projects that we did, inventors we like, uh, artists that we like, and just uh, put it in the discussion and discuss it. Mm -hmm. After that, we're going to discuss uh, in the second half of the podcast. Uh, the, topic. the topic? The topic of the episode. Uh, yeah. Collaborative yeah. design yeah. Um, and supported by augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and then we will do the outro. And, and that's, that's it. it. Yeah. Um, yours. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Which pitch of the month? It's time. Okay. It's time. Like uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, you, what have you came up with this month? I came up with something, uh, basically a friend of mine showed me uh, a video on the internet and it's a video about something new, um, something which I like very much because uh, it's from, I don't know if we can mention brands, I think we can, it's yeah. from Corona, out. like the, the tequila flavored mm -hmm. stuff yeah, yeah. and um, they, they sell cans of beer and do you know, like, like a, it's like a symbol for climate change and pollution, like the six plastic rings they put on uh, cans of beer in the supermarket. Uh, I think they only do that in America, actually. Here, you don't really yeah. have that. But they get like the plastic rings, uh, it's six of them. And then you very often see these videos of ducks or fishes that have them around their head. And oh, yeah, yeah, slowly like the, dying. the thingies, yeah. yeah okay, 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 okay. So they, they made an attempt to like rule that out. And what they came up with, I, f I think it's, it's very smart. They, they, uh, they made the edge... Bigger beer cans. Yeah. What? <laughs> Bigger beer cans. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. You can just put six in one now. <laughs> you don't need the plastic. <laughs> no, but they, they, they got the edges, uh, mm -hmm. the bottom and the, uh, the top edges of the can. They reshaped those to, to have wire, like thread. And you can now um, like screw one can onto another. Okay. So if you buy if you buy six like, cans of beer, or make, like if you want five, you can just grab five and you could make it like a like a like a wand, like the game okay, wizarding. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> ideal for the game wizarding. Yeah. You can go look that yeah, up. We'll put it in the comments again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like, like that's it. I I designed some stuff and I really like to to like you have to think nowadays about the like the environmental impact of your product. Like I think mm -hmm. as an industrial design engineer. Like you, you're oh, you can say, if important. you go that way, why not use those beer cans just to build your own home at a certain moment? <laughs> <laughs> Acting with Lego, so you build your own student house at a certain moment. If you drink it, wow, sleeping bear. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Oh, but that would be a really good promotional stunt, though. Like build yeah. student housing by Corona cans. Yeah. <laughs> they should do that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so that's that's my thing. I really like that. Okay, I like it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, should we just move right on to uh, to yours? 
Yeah. Jean, Jean, um, is being Jean. My French Pitch of the Month is um, about the movie I'm Mother. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a sci-fi movie. It's about a movie that the world is going down and uh, you know the, the story. Uh, uh, robots survived. Uh, Ooh, a lot of robots survived. Oh. And they are uh, <laughs> making the ultimate human because uh, AIs are like um, bringing up children mm -hmm. and making the human like the ubermensch or the, yeah. the, the person that is <laughs> oh. that is better, better than everyone. So we had some experience like, with that. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> we did not really remember yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, it, it sounds, it sounds um, like, um, like dystopian, but um, the idea is really good. The movie is really good itself. Uh, I won't give uh, a lot of spoilers, but the design thing about uh, how uh, the mother is designed because it's a robot. Mm -hmm. It's a robot. Does have a child? Yeah, it's a, a robot that takes care of a child. Okay. And um, how would you design such a robot? Because I was watching at the, at the movie and I was like, would you design it like humanoid or like human like? Yeah. Or would you design it more like a robot? Like practical. Yeah, because. Which should be done with a child instead of why having it a copy of a mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. through that. And well, isn't like a mother already like evolutionally made to be practical for what has to be done with a child? Yeah, but not only yeah. for the child, it's also for yeah. things before and after. Oh, okay, fair yeah. enough. If yeah. you look to a breeding factory for um, small ducks, for example, or okay. even pigs, yeah. that's completely aligned with only having the heat and feeding yeah, and yeah. cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. only thing needed. Then we have this thing with human being. We want to have being in touch with each other and there should be some social yeah. interaction. Mm -hmm. We have to guide those children into society. Mm. Yeah. Actually, it's, a good, it's a good question. Can a robot do that? But, but, should a robot but, be but a the human cool, then? The cool yeah. thing about that was that uh, later on in the movie, a real woman came to the, to the dorm oh, yeah, where, yeah. where, where I live. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she, the, 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 the child got confronted with a real person, a real mm -hmm. mom, because she, she hasn't seen only movies on, on screen, mm -hmm. but not the real mother, because the real mother had like heating and stuff like that, what you already said, yeah. that, to take care of the child and be really practical. And she also got like the, the interactions with the child. So that was also fixed. But, okay, but uh, I, I was like, how would you design it in the, how would it look? Because I was now like a bit yeah. like uh, distance between. It's a machine or it's a machine. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, but if you, if you grow up as a child and you, you haven't seen anything like a human being, then maybe it's just, oh, that's very nice. That's my mom. This is yeah. this. Yeah, <laughs> it well, looks great. <laughs> It reminds me a bit about my childhood when I, not from me as a child, but <laughs> well, I, had had a, <laughs> yeah. I never saw, them. only saw robots, but yeah. <laughs> therefore not still science engineering, but Your mom no, sounds great. I, had a duck. <laughs> I had a small duck and we just, I don't know why, but mom died and I had a duck, a small duck. Okay. I raised it, gave it some uh, food, became bigger, and at a certain moment I put it back in the pond with the other ducks. Mm. The first thing the stupid duck did was ate all the other ducks. What? What? It ate yeah. them? Yeah. I never saw a duck, and he said, oh, that's perhaps an enemy, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> and the other ducks were completely unaware because they were not seeing a danger, you see, just another duck. So the first thing he did, after, I say, 15 or 20 minutes, he killed all the other ducks. <laughs> that's it. You made a war machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you made a war machine. Aware of that. <laughs> so, like, I, did, I didn't know that ducks eat meat, by the way. No, they don't. They don't. They, don't. So, <laughs> they just killed them. Yeah. This makes no sense. Okay. He was just scared to squish shit out of himself. <laughs> Wow. And it happens to those things. <laughs> oh, amazing. Uh, I think we have to move on. Yeah. Because we can talk about this for an hour. I think. Roy, definitely. Right. Uh, what, is, what is your French French? You have, what have you brought for us? It's always difficult asking me to only bring one point, but I have one point. I okay, made okay. my decision uh, two minutes ago. Nice. Um, I read a news article, it was uh, early this week on last week. We have the Alipay system, or at least in, uh, in China, you can pay with Alipay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just we have the PayPal and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They have now the functionality, you can just look into a mirror, so a um, double-sided mirror, and a camera will scan you and your facial recognition is your payment method. Really? That works already for some months or years, wow. no exactly how long. Mm. So at the ch uh, checkout, you just look at the screen, done, that's it. Really? They now implement a new functionality, and that really triggered me. They have add a beauty filter. A be what? Because people did not the like payment. Yeah, people didn't like it. They stand in front of the camera and they see their own reflection or their own um, photo yeah. representation, just a video feed, that's it. And people were really confronted with their own face. <laughs> what? So Alipay now implements a beauty filter that if you look into the screen, they will improve your, uh, your image. <laughs> no way. Yeah, oh, your face is improved based on what Alipay th thinks is 
better for you. Uh, yeah. I, th they, they, I think maybe there's something, I don't know if there's something Chinese or that Apple phones have that as well, uh, or let's say American phones or other phones, but I have a Chinese phone as well. Mm -hmm. And like standardly, it has all these kinds of weird effects that make your face slimmer, exactly. your skin is yeah. softer, but like my face is already really slim. Is so if I take a picture, <laughs> like it purifies, like it's really, really, really yeah. small. Well, yeah. th this reminds me of when you are opening your phone that you actually then accidentally open your camera. Yeah, that effect indeed. Yeah. You don't want to prevent that, and yeah. therefore this well, we just put a filter over it, standard, yeah. so everybody gets a different view of itself yeah. because perhaps other guys in the line could see your screen. You don't want that, of course. That's, that's really not okay, I think. No. I no, think. no. Well, it's, like, it's, it's, really, it's really wrong. Yeah. It's really in line with all the stuff we heard last week from the deep fake or um, even the deep nude app, where mm. you could not see the difference between an artificial made image or a real image. Yeah. yeah. If you're already using now our own images converted to an artificial one, yeah. how yeah. do we even distinguish ourselves between our virtual enhanced copy of ourselves mm. and yeah. ourselves? Yeah, if you if you only show like 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 if you had eye mother and you combine that with this and yes. you only show the child a mirror image enhanced mirror image you will yourself, never know how yeah. it looks like wow. you, you don't know what you look like and that's, that's a nice thing because I also saw that some years ago in a, a cartoon and they said you never have seen your own face you've only seen the reflection of your own face yeah and that's true that's true you could not you cannot see your own face so if we implement the, all these kind of tricks you will never see your own face again. You never know, know how you look like. Like, like, a, like a pre historian person who's looking yeah. water and like, hmm. Yeah. Hmm. If it That's digitized the water, though, then yeah. they're screwed. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, man. Damn. Okay. Okay. So that triggered me a bit. Yeah. Ooh. I like it. Um, I don't know if I like it. <laughs> no, I, I like the punch, uh, punch, punch of the yes. one. I don't like the idea, but. <laughs> <laughs> it frightens me a bit. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah, technology. It's That's like. So. Yeah, triggering me for, because. What's the real me now? <laughs> Mirrors. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> don't trust them. Yeah, to everyone listening, as you might, well, you maybe don't know, but Sean is like the philosophical type. So if you trigger him with these kind of questions, shit will get out of hand. Yeah. <laughs> it will go wrong. Well, at the moment, we're just heading into the, the fake news. So how do we know what's real and what's not real, even this conversation? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I don't know if I'm here or not. Bad. It's all yeah. fake. <laughs> we're going to talk about virtual reality right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's time. It's a good bridge. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a good bridge. <laughs> Um, the collaborative design. Yeah. Yeah. But could you maybe, uh, Roy, um, explain the term collaborative design and what might mm -hmm. be the use of virtual reality? Or oh, and then you hope that's clear for me, but I'll try. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we need you. <laughs> well, the thing is that um, it's collaborative design. Um, it's even more also incorporating that decision making support. Okay. So we think that if you are not a design engineer or an engineer whatsoever, I think that every engineer was felt for this one. If you're going to design new stuff or you're making new stuff, it's always a collaboration between you and different people. Yeah. yeah. Different, different backgrounds. Yeah. And yes, I'm sorry. All different expertise, you need them because they have their own expertise. You don't understand them because they have their own expertise. So normally you have all those translation steps or misinterpretations about what, uh, what is said. So already for years we're working on how can we make an environment where engineers, but also other stakeholders who are involved, even guys from the sales or the financial department, everybody who's involved, how can we take them in one kind of environment and show them what the results are of their current decisions? So instead of making the decisions and seeing them as some kind of yeah, well, threshold or real activity, we see making decisions as a tool. It's a tool and if we want to try out, we can try out, okay, what if we make the decision to go left at this moment? What will it happen from my perspective? But I also want to show it from a different perspective. What will be the consequence from the sales perspective or the financial perspective? or even the end user perspective. Okay. Okay. Um, Normally you could say, yeah, okay, you can you can explain it. At least as a design engineer, you can try to explain it. But at a certain moment, um, you still have to get into the head of the other person to understand what does he really see, what does he want to see. Okay. So we think the combined reality, augmented reality, screens, any kind of visualization whatsoever, to show how the potential reality would look like, okay. makes it more a real discussion setting where you could say, okay, but I want to have for example, a coffee cup, I want to make it blue. Okay, perfect, why not? It's just a design perspective. Okay. Perhaps from the guy from material perspective says, well, okay, blue, uh, fine, but I cannot make it. Yeah. So from him, it's a completely different perspective. 
for the end user said, well, I don't want blue anymore because you have enough blue. So even the small, small and minor differences or minor uh, things you change can have a big impact on other people which you can't really incorporate on. Of course, you can have imagination for, well, I think he will like it, I think it will work. I'm the expert, I'm the spider in the web, and I can combine everything. <laughs> like yeah. every industrial yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. so why not make a tool to use the spider in the web principle? Okay. So as an industrial design engineer, designing that spider in the web system, architecture, framework, however you want to call it, to help yeah. that. Okay, it, it sounds to me like you, you make some kind of digital model of your product or mm -hmm. process, and yeah. you, you can... D dependent on the person that looks at it, it will give different, like a different lingo or language for the same data. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a kind of data filtering, mm -hmm. um, but not really being aware of yourself that you filter data. It should be just your perspective and your viewpoint. And it also should not only be uh, digital. We often talk about making virtual models and virtual models we can have layers which show information and which add information or um, hide information. But I also want to incorporate the context where it happens in. Okay. Because if we only okay. talk about the conditioned environment, which a virtual environment is, you will also make some kind of errors because you don't know the environment completely. So we need to have it in line with the context. We need to know what is really happening in the context. People need to work with the equipment already, need to work with the product we designed, not only looking at it, only having a picture and standing at side and say, okay, yeah, well, it looks nice, okay, let's do it. It's different than really, okay, now start using it. Proud. Okay, so we so really see it as a tool for that one. Okay, so also having an experience with the Yes, yes, it's definitely. Um, and that's also where the design part kicks in. How should such an experience look like? So should it incorporate only the visual experience or the auditive or tangible or haptic or even influencing the nerve system? All things can be an experience. And that's also our part here, um, how we try to use that virtual augmented reality part. Yeah. Really seeing it as some kind of a design tool instead of a kind of a solution. So it's really used to understand what the consequence of my design will be at this stage or perhaps five years from now or two seconds from now to understand, okay, well, what if I made the decision to go right instead of to go left? Will the future will look different? You then? can extrapolate that. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, hopefully. Because I, w I wanted to ask you um, like two things. Uh, but first of all, it sounds, um, if you want to put in the haptic feedback or the auditive feedback or maybe the, the scent, actually of the thing that you're designing. Um, well, just to put in another buzzword, um, we got rapid prototyping nowadays. Yeah. If, you, if you're designing something basic as a cup or a tablet, yeah. um, how it, it sounds like a lot of trouble to make a, a digital virtual reality model that incorporates all these aspects that you could just 3D print a tablet and just, look, what do you think? Does it feel good? Does it, you know? Yeah. How is, is, do you think this is, uh, is, is worth the trouble? I think at a certain moment um, it will become. I think with smaller products, which are quite simple, for example, um, perhaps not. Mm. If you look into complete environments, so a production environment or a house or a city center or big machinery whatsoever, I think then it will be. Mm. Especially because as a designer, you have to make the decision on your material, on your design. So you have to m make the decision and have to store it somewhere, yeah. whether it's in your CAD model or any kind of database we have. At a certain moment, you have to make a decision. If we now can make fertile representations of that decision, incorporating material properties, even the smell of the material or the texture, how it feels, yes, of course, then we could directly use it. I must say, yeah. at the moment, if you, for example, do the additive manufacturing on the rubber prototyping. Sorry, which? The additive manufacturing. So, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, of course, if you print everything out, then you will lose the dynamic aspect because it's already printed out. And if people say, oh, I don't like this edge, Oh, sorry, throw it away, print a new yeah. one. Oh, yeah. So at a certain moment, you also have to lose that one and say, okay, but to what extent can we virtualize also that part? If that can be completely virtualized, virtualized you can also can feel the texture, feel uh, the surface uh, finish, etc., then it's quite easy to do. Mm. So I must say, the end user is, I think, one of the hardest parts to do because end user is more focused on his experience, oh, yeah. which is often yeah. a one-off. Yeah. I think easier and perhaps at a certain moment also at this moment more desirable to incorporate all those different engineers. He wants to know if it can be fabricated on his machine. He wants to know if it can be paid from uh, the budget available. The marketeer mm -hmm. wants to know can I be able to, uh, to market this. That's more, I think, a more structured approach. 
Yeah. Then you have, you know, this guy only has these machines available, so he has to be in line with that. This material will cost this, can only be manufactured like that. So as a design tool, really in your design phase, um, having a lot of iteration and a lot of um, variance and dynamic aspects of your product, perfect, should do that. At a certain moment when you go to really the end user, when do you make a step? If everything is completely flexible and we have, we don't need any physical device anymore, then you can incorporate the end user quite fast, of course. Oh. If you have to make really 3D print parts, it will give you already some delay. Yeah. And our, our goal is now to find out, can any kind of VR, AR, what kind of equipment help us to overcome that? So you mm. can already re use, experience your products, even if it's not there. How, do you have examples of the, uh, how you could use it? Oh, definitely. Do if you we, apply this already? Yeah, yeah we yeah. apply it already for, yeah. um, I think already 15 years, something like that. Oh, so, really? <coughs> at the early stage, of course, it was you don't have to look at the visualizations as the quality of the renderings because we don't care about the quality of renderings. It's about quality of experience. Um, if you look into that, then you see that even if we design a simple product, <coughs> make it a coffee machine or even a high end uh, mini machine, um, the last thing we did, or last thing, I think the first one we did, was that production line. So, we had a complete production line designed mm -hmm. to see can a product be fabricated and how will the users of the machinery use the machine? Virtually or physically? Both, the combined. Oh, okay. One machine was really physically present, mm -hmm. some machines were virtually present. Mm -hmm. So they could yeah. use the real machine, do some maintenance, do their normal performance task. At a certain moment, you said, okay, now we have the new machine, do the same task. So they did the task, normal, every day, eight, days, uh, eight hours a day working task, but also do some maintenance. And then we certainly saw that um, one of the people wearing uh, VR goggles, dead on the floor, on his back, hands in the air, on a concrete floor. Yeah, at a certain moment, different. the manager of the factory <laughs> saw that and he said, well, why is that guy on the floor <laughs> wearing a VR headset? What's, what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. And the guy said, well, I'm just doing the normal everyday maintenance to the machine we have. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> so are you really in the factory normally also laying on that concrete floor for 10 or 15 minutes? Oh yes, already for two or three years. Because oh, really? this wow. machine has this kind of maintenance. The manager was really confused. He said, well, is this what we do to our people? Mm. Yes, you do. Um, well, in the specification of the machine, that was never mentioned. It was just based on that, in theory, you could do it standing. Just yeah, standing. In theory. In course. practice, it was far more easy and faster to do it on your back. Mm. But you aren't allowed to do that. You don't want your people to lay under a machine having all kinds of stuff in their hands. So. It was really an eye-opener for them that the, the machine was wrong or the positioning of the machine was wrong. Mm. At least yeah. one of those two. And so you could change your fabrication line or you could change the machinery, whatever you want. So that's for them, and that's already years ago, a real eye-opener and they changed the complete fabrication line based on that. Mm. So it can visualize <coughs> problems that you otherwise wouldn't see maybe. Exactly. This, this method. Exactly. How is this different from making a digital twin? Because another it's partly it's partly aligned with that. Um, digital twin is the real buzzword kicking in the last years, mm -hmm. um, and suddenly we're doing digital twins. Yeah, we're not changing yeah. our task last years, but oh, okay. <laughs> it's just, the same now we have a label and now we're doing digital twins. <laughs> it sounds fancy, though. Yes, yeah. it really does. And I think it's also uh, related to what you see now in um, in the news the last weeks. It just allowed to use a smartphone and a bicycle anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's something we could already predict that was going to happen, of course, because the car was already forbidden for, uh, for some years. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. But I think it can also be a nice trigger to see, okay, we have that VR, AR technology available. Mm -hmm. The only thing we use the phone for is getting data from somewhere to our minds. That's the whole idea. We use a screen for that. I would say that, it, but if we have already AR available, can we use AR goggles on the bicycle now? Mm -hmm. Is that about yes or no? <coughs> I think because the you're not touching yeah. anything, yeah. it can distract you perhaps, but you can also say not yeah, distracting, it, it, it can, can help, help you. you. Yeah. Oh wow. It can warn you for, yeah. for an ambulance, or it can warn you for obstacles, or it can even warn you for a uh, slippery road at a certain moment. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. If a guy already fell on the road uh, 15 minutes ago because there was some ice on it, and your AR goggles can show you that you have to slow down, that yeah. would be nice. It would be nice, <coughs> because I was thinking about it, that you like have a filter on it, uh, mm -hmm. They already had it on the phone. It was like bicycle uh, fly mode that mm -hmm. you could put on. Yes. But I think that also uh, could work on augmented reality classes or something like that. 
that you put just put a filter on like the mirror exactly. <laughs> yes <laughs> and, uh, just put a filter on so that you don't see messages and pops up uh, pop-ups and stuff like that but only the additional information that could help you and that's yeah. i asked a question because the, the industry is long waiting for some kind of a breakthrough when when reality kicks in as a consumer product in industry we use it already for years and it's mm. quite common to use yeah. it there and the industry is of, is really aiming on okay, but we want to have that consumer using AR. Okay. <coughs> we see now big market. For some uh, they think at yeah. least Apple Can is also imagine. paying attention to it now. Mm. They make their own Apple uh, AR glasses, mm. and they're really waiting for the moment. Okay, when do we have to do something with it? Um, in the car, when they abandoned the phones in the car, we saw that immediately Android Auto kicked in, Apple CarPlay kicked in. Yeah. So you have that information available. They have those. Um, semi-transparent screens where you look at, or at least projection um, head-mounted displays. Mm -hmm. And I saw with the new Mercedes car, they also have now augmented reality and navigation systems. So really? they just project on your windscreen really? okay. where you should Ooh. drive on the street. That's really <coughs> nice. Wow, I'd like that. Yeah. It's really good because you don't have to look at your screen anymore. It's just yeah. looking straight ahead and you yeah. see a digital arrow on yeah. the road. Ooh. Yeah, it's <coughs> really cool. Um, just to bring it back to collaborative design a bit mm -hmm. again. Do you think like companies like the big ones that make these these AR devices? Do you think they could use collaborative design and the uh, well the, the VR AR tools that you're designing or creating? Yeah, definitely. Just we to were... plan when they when they implement this technology. I they already do that. They already do that. If you see that um, big industry, how often they use AR and VR for what we then call the multi-stakeholder decision support. Mm. So yeah. we really want to support at making decisions and facilitate making decisions. Um, it sometimes goes further or a bit different direction than collaborative design, okay. because we don't want to say that everybody is a designer at a certain moment, mm. definitely not. We want to take into consideration all the different perspectives. So you as a designer keep, you are in charge. Yeah. And often what we see with other approach of collaborative design is I say, okay, partly of my design, I throw it to the user and he has to design it for me. Mm. No, he's just a user, not a designer. You can use his information for you design, but you are the designer. Fair enough. <clears throat> so I think that if you look into that and you say, um, can we use technology to predict when we should put a new product on the market or how the product will be experienced? Oh yes, definitely, it's already done. Yeah, it's already done. So I think all the large companies already use those kind of technologies to see will it work out well. Okay. But often they use it for a slight part of their design phase. And we here want to develop um, an, an approach where you could use it throughout all the design phases. So it's just your normal day routine and you don't have to prepare using AR or VR. Okay. It's just click, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Mm. Yeah, well, I guess other universities or other companies uh, will be busy with this as well. Do you think this will be the future? Or do you think you have some, some points? Yeah, it's, it's the nice thing is we develop this together with other universities. There's oh, really? a strong col collaboration between, wow. for example, the University of Twente and I think even hundreds of universities abroad. Really? Oh, yeah. we, that's, um, a, that's a big number. Yeah, we talk to each other um, two times a year. So we already have meetings, really physical meetings, two times a year, just to align with each other. What are we doing? Um, giving presentations, giving keynotes, what is going on? Okay. Those discussions or those two years, uh, two times a year meeting is also um, open for industry or not open, but their industry partners are aligned with that. Okay. So all the big industry partners, the car manufacturers, the electronic manufacturers, they're also in that consortium. So we already know a lot what's going on. Mm -hmm. Car industry is, of course, we think sometimes a bit ahead of it. Okay. They um, already do everything digital. They have all the models available. Getting it really in line with the whole fabrication system is, of course, a big step to go. Um, but aligning that means that we at Universal Twente here, try to focus on, okay, we are the guys who understand how to give some kind of a decision-making support system. Okay. We develop those kind of things. What we use, for example, if we develop digital twins or digital masters or that whole architecture, mm. we use all the information from other expertise. So we incorporate um, simulations made by mechanical engineers. We incorporate um, psychology insights from the psychology department. Yeah. So we find ourselves, again, that perhaps spider in the web, or at least oh, yeah, yeah. we make the network connections between all those different expertise, and we're not going to determine what their precision is, we're going to determine what their relation is to the product or to a colleague. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's the thing where Twente is quite strong. We say, no, we know exactly who is involved in designing a product, and we mention the relation, and we say, 
is that relation based on X or Y, or is it positive or negative? Is it influencing or just looking at it? So we're providing an overview. And then all the other universities and all the other companies, they add up to that. And we're trying to link it together. Oh, that's nice. Okay, cool. That's actually, yeah. <coughs> like, that's how we, we portray the role of the industrial design engineer. The yeah. person that brings everything yeah, yeah, together, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's, that's what we're, it's we're having the overview, what is going on. And yeah. also knowing what to ask to others. Yeah. So if I don't know what to ask to an expert on tribology, for example, I cannot talk to him. I understand his words. If I can really incorporate his vision and his simulation in the eventual model, he will make decisions and I will understand his decisions and I will see what decisions from his perspective mean for my perspective. Oh, perfect. Then we just have a working environment again. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, we're closing in on time, but I, th I think we can ask. We can do one more question. Yeah, uh, yeah, you have uh, a question. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I, I have person. a lot of questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can talk out for an hour, I guess. Um, but uh, the f one I'm most interested That's in... That's a final question, eh? Yeah. Final okay, question. Um, Alright, your final question. Mm. I'm yeah. also interested in you, Roy. Because yeah. uh, what are you doing right now at the moment? Uh, what I'm doing at the, the moment? In the world of uh, collaborative de design. We're working on a podcast now. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, really? Yeah. That's so nice. Tell us more about it. <laughs> you like it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But well, at the moment. Um, What's new? The nice thing is, yeah. I think I also studied industrial design engineer. So I finished it 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'm still considering myself as a industrial design engineer. Um, now more on the research uh, part. Mm. Strongly related to what industry is doing and strongly related to what we want the students to do. The big project now going on is what we call a testbed. And the testbed is in fact um, an environment, partly real, partly uh, virtual, where we can try out how a product or a production line will function. But it means that we really are going to build um, physical environments which contain machinery or products which are real, tangible and real, and partly virtual. So we could say, okay, what if we have, for example, this um, injection molding machine, and if we add a robot to that, will it really work better? Yeah. <laughs> and if we add an automatic guide vehicle to that, will it really improve my production speed or yeah. improve my understanding about what's going on? Mm -hmm. We want to really just pick up a robot, throw it in physically, physically, or say, oh, we don't have a physical robot here, then do it virtually. So we just want to switch, uh, switch between virtual and real when possible. And that's really possible, cool. because that, that sounds really complicated. How are you yeah. going to do it? It is, and therefore we need students. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. We have a lot of students now uh, working yeah. on this one. Um, we do it also as university and also as what we have the Fraunhofer Project Center at universities, big yeah. research institute. About and the students together with industry, so it's a real triangle of all those different uh, stakeholders. Cool. And at the end of this year, we want to have the first demonstrator. So that oh. means that we have a scale model of a factory built with automatic guide vehicles, with robotic arms, with miniature machinery. And they behave like a real factory. Mm. And they can even mimic a real factory. So we can get data of a real factory, put it in those machines, and they will act as if they are doing a real task. Mm. Okay. And we could say, okay, but now we take one of those machines out, put a new one in, one in which is faster or better. Physically, yeah. digitally, or it doesn't, yeah. matter. Digitally, it doesn't matter anymore. What you want. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter anymore. Oh. How will it cope with the data coming from reality at the moment and what will it give back to reality? What if we add a second robotic arm? Or worst case scenario, I'm going to stand in between the robots. Mm. What oh, will happen okay. then? How much uh, shit will happen at the moment? <laughs> how, how do they communicate with each other? There are some open standards. Uh, we don't want to pick a standard, but we want to um, allow multiple standards to, uh, to work together. Yeah. So we want to have yeah. that, yeah, let's say, duct tape approach. It should work together at some moment. Yeah. Mm. But we also want to incorporate VR and AR because I want to see what a certain product is doing or a machine is doing, what yeah. kind of data does it yeah. get, what yeah. kind of activities it's going to do now or the upcoming five or 10 or 20 uh, seconds. Okay. But we're also going to incorporate um, just Beamer, just projection. So if projection from the top of the ceiling onto the floor, showing the non-visible data lines, making them visible again. There is data flowing here, or there's a product oh, yeah. in here over two okay. seconds, so please step aside. So it's really combining all the things we do in, uh, in industrial design engineering in one environment, and we can say, okay, now we're just focusing on one product and see how the product runs over the line. Now we're focusing on having a new machine. How will that work? So it's a real uh, flexible environment where sometimes things are real, sometimes things are virtual, but eventually you don't know if they are real or virtual. They're just mm, yeah. mixed up. Like your face <laughs> in the beauty. Uh, yeah. Beautified. <laughs> exactly. So therefore, uh, also my link with the <laughs> <laughs> Man. 
Okay. Back to the deep fake. We don't know what's real and what's yeah. fake. <laughs> you <don't know>. just, <laughs> we're just using that one as a tool again. <laughs> I think industrial design engineers um, are also the guys who make the new tools mm -hmm. to make products. So not also yeah. only making products, but we're also making our own tools to make those products. Yeah. And whether those tools are support in your visualization or decision making or interaction or user experience. It's just aligning and understanding what you're doing and finding the relation between if I tweak a button here, what will happen in two years' time? Hmm. I don't want to call it the butterfly effect because that's yeah, a bit too broad, but yeah. that idea, yeah, why not? Thanks you, thanks, thanks you. Thanks you. Thanks you, Roy. Oh, I'm even multiple yeah. now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, thank you, Roy, very much for being here. Uh, I had you're a great time. You're welcome. Um, yeah. Thanks, every, what, what, Sean? Yeah, thank the listeners yeah. for listening. Thank you very much for listening. Definitely. Yeah. Um, hopefully we'll see you back in a month. Let's say first Friday of the month again. Yeah. First Friday of the month, Podcast Friday, Icarus Podcast. Um, don't forget, if you have any comments, any suggestions, anything you didn't like, especially the things you didn't like, please let us know. Yeah. But no fake news in this one. No <laughs> fake news. <laughs> Keep it real. Uh, keep it real. <laughs> let us know. The, the email address is podcast at didalus.u20.nl. Uh, um, and if that's too complicated, just leave a comment on the YouTube video. And once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next month. Thanks for having me.